Hey guys, and welcome back to the Original Strength Podcast. This week, uh, we have brought back our very special guest, Mr. Alex Salkin, and Alex and I are going to be talking about the benefits of hanging. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me back. So Alex, um, just recently you wrote an article for us on the Original Strength blog uh, talking about the benefits of hanging, and really you there was a lot of information in there that I have never heard before. Um, basically, uh, the the relevance or the correlation of hanging and grip strength with the with life expectancy. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was phenomenal. So, like, I don't know how you learned about all that stuff, but can you tell us a little bit about? Well, the benefits of hanging. I know you do a lot of hanging yourself. Well, yeah, I was first uh, introduced to the idea of hanging back in, it was probably like 2011. I was re- I bought a book, Convict Conditioning 2, by an uh, ex-con, Paul Wade. And one of the things he talked about in there was hanging for the purpose of grip strength. And I think instinctively, like I kind of knew that that sort of a thing would strengthen your grip because I had read... And uh, one of Pavel's books, Beyond Bodybuilding, um, that a great way to do more pull-ups is to hang a little bit longer, like when you, you do a rep and you maybe you hang, you know, 10 seconds or more before you do the next rep because it, it just helps your he, – he presented it as more of a way of building grip endurance, but grip strength and endurance uh, both feed off each other very well. So, I, you know, and, and we, I talked about Dan John in, in the last episode we were on, and he has also mentioned the same thing about – uh, doing pull-ups and and hanging at the bottom to improve your your grip strength, and um, so I had heard about it in a lot of different places, but it wasn't until I I read that book that I decided I was going to give it a shot for myself, and uh, and I really liked it. I thought it was uh, you know I thought it was simple. It was fun. I could definitely notice a difference in uh, how my grip strength and endurance felt, and uh, and later I found that there were a lot of other uh, benefits to it as well. And uh, so I, I talked about a couple of those in the in the article, but building a very strong grip is certainly one of them. Now, when you when you do your hanging, I know you do um, you, know, you do a lot of body weight calisthenics, um, gymnastic type things as well. Do you do you incorporate uh, brachiation or swinging uh, with your hanging, or do you just do like dead hangs or uh, pull ups? Like like what kind of things do you do? I like doing like stuff on the monkey bars, you know, where you're brachiating, meaning you're going. We're not just uh, hanging, for example, but you're actually moving from place to place. Um, At my house, unfortunately, I don't really have the opportunity to do that. I only have a door jam pull-up bar. I have yet to install uh, monkey bars. I'm thinking about it, but it it hasn't been done just yet. And um, but when I get a chance, I do like to do it because there's a certain, uh, you know, what's what's great about it is you get a lot of like staying in place with a lot of the other exercises we love. I'm a big fan of kettlebells and body weight. Like with push-ups, it's just you're in one place. You could ostensibly have just a few feet of space, and you could do as many push-ups as you want because you don't need to go anywhere. So when you have the opportunity to actually put your strength in action and go from point A to point B and beyond, uh, it really builds up a lot more than just strength but the ability to apply it. So I like uh, doing that stuff. Unfortunately, I just don't have enough um, – I don't have enough space. Uh, no, I wouldn't say I don't have enough space. I have enough space. And I don't have enough equipment to do that. But uh, but that's the. I would say that would be step two after you start working on hanging and you know and you have strength to do pull ups and things like that. Definitely you know stuff on the monkey bars, going from point A to point B, uh, swinging things like that. It's uh, it's awesome. So I don't know if you can see it, but right there, there's a the the old pull up bar over the doorway, and I can. Um, I will just, here's Tim's life tip, uh, number 47. Don't do brachiation from, or swinging from, from those things right there. Unless you want an angry spouse, you don't it do ends, that. It ends very badly. Um, <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, everyone's okay, but uh, it's how you learn, though. Um, Absolutely. If you, if you ever try to swing on those things, you learn very quickly not to do that. Um, so, that aside... Um, you in your article, which had, again, um, if you haven't read that article, guys, I'll put the link for that on the bottom of the in the notes of the podcast or the podcast. But um, you mentioned that grip strength is even a better predictor at heart disease than blood pressure is. Mm-hmm. That's that's fascinating to me. Same here, actually. I remember reading that um, in an article. I mean, there was, this was at a time when like a whole spate of articles came out on this topic. 
there was a big study done, I think with 40,000 participants, which is like, like astronomical. It was uh, from 140,000. 140,000. Oh my goodness. 40,000. Yeah. I, that's unbelievable. 140,000 people in one study. Um, it was done through, I believe it was McMaster University. And uh, they found that when they followed up with the people that they studied, that the people who had issues with grip strength, and they, they tested their grip with, um, there's a kind of a machine that you can use that will test your, like how many pounds of force you're able to produce. Uh, and they found a direct correlation between um, death from all causes. And that includes stuff like cancer, pneumonia, stuff you wouldn't even think that you know, any amount of strength would really help you to overcome. Um, but evidently there's a, a very direct and very clear connection between the two of them. Um, yeah, I found it uh, pretty unbelievable because prior to this, you know, for me, grip strength has always been kind of more of a, like a pride sort of a thing. Um, you know, you shake somebody's hand for the first time and, you know, you've got like a stronger grip than them, especially when they're bigger. Cause I, I'm kind of like a, like a slight gentleman, I'm pretty average height, you know, like normal body weight. Um, and you don't want to get chumped when you're when you're shaking somebody's hand like that because it's all too easy for that to happen, particularly when their hand like engulfs yours. So that's only like a, a part of the story, but it is a part of the story. Um, but uh, the, you know, but the other thing too is that when it comes to athletic performance, you'll definitely find that you have uh, better performance on average. Uh, uh, Jed Johnson, who's a grip expert, has talked about this. He's mentioned it could be anything from you know baseball, like your ability to hold on to the ball. You know, better while you throw it so you've got more control or whether it's you know more uh, control over the bat or grabbing a football having you know uh, better control of it uh, things like that that you don't really think are all that important or you know that you wouldn't need that much grip strength for a, a little bit more can make a, a big a big impact and um, and then when it comes to the health side of things you know for me I was really only that interested in the in the performance side because I I thought you know it's helping me with my, my kettlebell lifts. It's helping me with my body weight strength. So I'm cool with that. Um, but then finding out the, the effects that it has on your health uh, was, you know, for me, that was just another, another big plus. And I think really uh, divorcing health from strength is something that a lot of people do. And uh, I think that there's, there's no better way to meld the two together than with something very foundational and fundamental like hanging, because not only is it good for uh, improving your grip strength, but it also, you're using your other parts of your body, the way that they're made to be used, we just don't do very often. Yeah, I don't think it, that you can really divorce health from strength because really strength is a foundational part of health to me. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you don't, if you if you don't have strength, well, really, how healthy are you? Exactly. Uh, especially, and and again, my definition of strength, and I think yours is probably, and I know, it's it's weird you make up your own definitions, but but I think I think yours is probably along the same lines. Is strength is the ability to to be able to live your life the way you want to, or mm -hmm. to to do manual tasks or whatever it is to go hiking or or what, to enjoy yourself, um, and. So, but without strength, you can't do any of that, those things, the things mm -hmm. you do. Um, so there's two things in the last, I don't know, maybe the last 10 years that have come out um, showing that uh, with correlation to longevity, uh, grip strength and being able to get up and down from the ground. Yeah. So if, if two things right there that if you could help somebody live a longer, healthier, happier, stronger life, it would be to strengthen your grip. And to be able to ensure that you can get up and down from the ground easily, I think. Um, I agree. You know, I think um, in terms of uh, you know definitions, like we talked about earlier. Number one, I, I have to say, I definitely think that that's a, a good way to look at it because you know when I talk about divorcing health from movement, like we all have seen uh, like videos of we'll say like uh, powerlifters or strongmen who are maybe very overweight lifting incredible amounts of weight. There's no question that they're insanely strong. Um, but, you know, I have, a, I have a friend who's a gym owner, and he had a, a pretty well-known uh, power lifter doing a, uh, a course at his gym, and he said that the gentleman had a difficult time getting off his back on the bench when he was demonstrating bench press. And, uh, and there's no doubt that the guy's insanely strong. I mean, his bench press is more than most people will ever deadlift, you know, in like, three or four sets and you can do it in one rep, you know? Um, but, uh, 
but it, it, I would definitely agree that if you're not strong, it's very unlikely that you're really going to be healthy. But it is possible to get uh, strong and not have the health go with it. So I think for for people who are like that, who have like ambitions of becoming you know the best that ever was at a certain thing, maybe that's that's just a sacrifice you have to make. But what does that have to do with you know people like us who want to be strong their whole lives, who want to be able to keep up with their kids and grandkids and give them a run for their money? You know, as we age and as we reach, uh, you know, 70, 80, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely, I, I definitely agree that the definition is important, and also understanding what its context is for you is important. And you, something else you said, and then as I went off on that long tangent, I forgot what was the next part of it. The next part, um, well, those, those just the two things that someone could do uh, oh, right. yeah. to maintain longevity so that they can live the life they want to. And, you know, and actually this is a great time too, to mention because I, you know, I wrote a couple of uh, notes prior to the show. Um, number one, that's absolutely true. Um, and I, I don't remember, I couldn't like mention like any university settings or studies where they demonstrated this, but in terms of getting up off the ground under your own power, that means with as little use of your hands as possible, Meaning, ideally, if you can get up off the ground from flat on your back without using your hands at all, statistically speaking, you, you have a better chance of, of uh, increased longevity. Yes. And uh, what better system to use than original strength, which teaches you how to maneuver your body on the ground, using the movements that you were designed to do from literally from day one, and from there, going on to do all the other stuff that you like to do and live, live life the way you want to live like you were saying. Right? right. And then one of the things that I think uh, is something that people should consider, because, you know, people might have all sorts of different um, hobbies or physical activities they like to engage in. And, uh, but thinking, too, about how they can build on top of that movement foundation that original strength sets down, you know, like your ability to get up and down off the ground with ease, right? Your ability to, to move normally, to be able to react to movement as it's happening and even before it happens. You know, what's the next step you can take? Because we talk about keeping up with your kids and grandkids, being able to lift weights if you like to do that, being able to play sports if you like to do that. And I think it also makes sense to engage in some of the other activities that um, you might not otherwise have a need to do, right? And, and I think that, you know, hanging, unless you're somebody who, who likes, uh, you know, scaling walls or building or doing all sorts of other things, you might not have a quote-unquote need to hang right but you're going to have a lot of benefits from doing it it's the same thing with like you know maybe you're not going to need to crawl you know there's not something that you have to duck underneath or there's not a tunnel that you have to crawl through or whatever but the benefits that you get from it are what make it reasonable or what make it something that you should want to do and uh, i think anybody who likes who likes os and has seen the benefits of it adding hanging is is just going to increase things by by tenfold so i was just thinking um, when you were explaining all that that so OS does a good job at restoring the foundation uh, and reflexive strength it really doesn't take advantage of grip strength as much mm -hmm. um, if at all but the need like so if a person can't really get up off the ground they don't have the strength to fight gravity well enough to push themselves up from the ground their second option is pulling themselves up from the ground and I've never exactly. thought about that before but without good grip strength, that second option becomes not necessarily an option either. Yeah. So I do think it would, I mean, having both is, is where you want to be for sure, I think. Absolutely. And, you know, I think another thing, too, is that um, even if you think about it, like let's look at just the original strength resets. And particularly, let's say, for example, uh, like rocking and crawling. Um, I, I have a, a student, somebody that I, I kind of consult with. Um, a guy named uh, Giovanni, and I remember a number of years ago, I, I wrote him out kind of like an experimental original strength program to do, and there was a lot of crawling involved. And one of the things that he pointed out is he said, like, my grip actually feels a lot stronger. And I thought, that's interesting, because there was no real grip work involved. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it's, you know, we spend so much of the day, like, let's say you do like lifting weights. You're lifting barbells, lifting kettlebells or dumbbells. You know, your hands are squeezed tightly around something, right? Or you're gripping your steering wheel or you're typing or whatever. Uh, we spend a lot of time with our, with our hands closed. We don't spend a lot of our time with our hands open. But uh, 
you know, I, your friend John Brookfield has written a great couple of great books on on grip strength. And one of the things he points out is that if your extensors or the other side of your forearm, the, the muscles that open your hand up, if they're not very strong, you're going to be limiting your grip. And if you've got like a, we'll say like a like a, a blockage of sorts because you're you're uh, missing out on that extension strength from the wrist, you're not really going to be able to put all of your effort into closing your hand, right? So I think that it's uh, an incredibly important thing. Because one of the things that uh, that people forget about is the need for some semblance of balance. You know, like maybe you're not going to have uh, like 100% balance, but rocking back and forth and really kind of gently getting your your hands and wrists used to uh, opening up a little bit more or crawling. And so you've got to add that stability component where it's just one hand moving at a time. Um, that's a very important part of the grip strength equation. As well, and uh, it's I would say that's a good first place to start. Obviously, there are other moves you could do a little bit later on down the line, but uh, yeah, without question, um, you know, OS and and grip strength work, particularly really foundational stuff like hanging, go together perfectly. So let me ask you this, um, because I know you help people. Uh, you're good at bridging the gaps for what where people want to be and what they can do. Mm -hmm. So say somebody wants to start hanging. And they've never they it's been a long time since they've done anything on the playground or they've been very sedentary where 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 do, where, do, where would you start them you know i had a question similar to this i did a uh, an insta story a couple of months back and somebody asked the same thing saying you know i can only i can only hang for like three seconds and my grip just gives out what what i have found to be pretty helpful for people is uh two things so number one the one I would start off with would be if you have TRX or you have uh, gymnastics rings, for example, I would work on like leaning back and uh, in kind of in like a body weight row position okay. and hanging from there. Because not only is that going to help you really figure out I mean, the gravity and the position you're in is going to really help you figure out what your shoulder blades should be doing, how to keep your shoulders pulled back. Right. Um, and you're also going to be you're going to be able to take a little bit of the load off of what your hands have to do to keep you in that place. So while it's not hanging with your hands overhead like what we would normally uh, think of, it's still getting you a lot of the same things. It's getting you the uh, back strength, it's getting you the grip strength. Um, it's getting you to figure out where your shoulder blades are and what they should be doing. Because believe it or not, this is something that a lot of people don't have a lot of control over. Um, and uh, naturally, it's also preparing your your hands to be able to hold on for a longer period of time so you know there's an endurance aspect to it but there's there's definitely a strength aspect it's similar to like if somebody can't do a push-up on the ground or they can only maybe do one or two uh, if you have them do it like on a countertop they can do 10 or 15 they can do a lot more or or maybe like a couple of chairs they might be able to knock out five or so right so it's sure. making it a little bit more easy and making it a little easier for them by changing the leverage um, and that's where i would start for number one. Number two, if you have access to a TRX unit or some gymnastics rings, you could hang them a little bit low so that your feet are still supporting you while you're hanging with the hands over your head. So this way, you are taking out most of the weight of the legs, uh, and you, but you still are getting the practice of hanging with your hands overhead now. So not only are you uh, getting a little bit more uh, body weight through your hands, but you're also going to be uh, improving your shoulder mobility, um, uh, you're going to be increasing the strength on your uh, on your back, uh, the control of your shoulder blades, and you're also going to kind of start to get uh, a little bit of like spinal decompression. Now, whether or not you can actually decompress the spine or just kind of stretch the muscles around it, I think there's some debate around that. But nevertheless, many people find that this is very good for their back because, similar to you know other things, we get a lot of uh, compression on the back, whether it's from slouching all day or you know, lifting weights and what have you, and we don't really get a whole lot of decompression or stretching out of those muscles. From there, you can start working on hanging with, uh, with your feet completely free and simply building up the time from there. Okay, so interesting story. Um, my brother-in-law, Chris Dillon, is six foot six, and uh, he, he's an engineer, works at a computer a lot. Um, so he decided that he was gonna start hanging uh, to, to help his, just to make his back feel better. And mm -hmm. 
three or four weeks ago, he got a hair to, you know what, I'm, he just wanted to go get a physical. He hadn't had a physical in a couple of years. Um, and he went to his physical and they measured his height at six foot seven. So he's a 45 year old who grew an inch from a year's worth of uh, regular con- uh, hanging. Basically. That is amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. You know, I have heard stories like that before, but some of them were a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word? I would say like the people, they had some like external weight, like somebody was pulling on them or whatever in order right. to gain some inches. That's, that's awesome. I mean, again, like I said, I'm kind of like a normal size guy. This kind of makes me feel like I need to be doing this on a daily basis too. That's amazing. So he was so, he was so shocked that he had them remeasure him again to verify that they didn't make a mistake. And literally, he's, so he's an inch taller now um, in better posture, uh, but he's just doing regular hanging. That's amazing. It is. is I cool. think it is pretty amazing for a 45-year-old because usually when you're in your, you don't hear a 40, 40-year-old's growing taller, you hear them shrinking, right? So Absolutely. So, and just from hanging, that's the only thing really, you know, that he had done different. Um, that's very right. cool. So I've got a question for you. There's a bunch of rules, a bunch of rules. There's, in exercise, we have rules. So if I'm hanging, where do I want my shoulder blades or how do I want my shoulders or my neck or do I want to, do I want to actively hang? Do I want to relax and hang? Do I want to let my joints hold, hold me up? Do I want to let my muscles hold me up? What, what are your thoughts on any of it and all of that? I, you know, a lot of that, one of the things that I, I wish more people would, would keep in mind about, uh, quote unquote, like fitness rules is that a lot of them are, are contextual. So they're not wrong per se, but they depend on the person. Right and on. because I've definitely heard the same thing too. Like when I started, uh, when I started hanging the, the rule kind of, or maybe it wasn't even like a written rule. It was just kind of like a recommendation was basically uh, you want it to be active hanging. And what active hanging means is that your shoulders, rather than being up by your ears, you're pulling them down so that you can kind of start to feel your back muscles working and, and things like that. Um, and uh, you didn't really want to do passive hanging. Now, again, I could be uh, I could be wrong about this, but again, my impression was just active hanging was, was the way to go. Uh, now, the opposite of that is passive hanging, where you let your shoulders come up and, you know, your your shoulders will be near your ears and you, you're using a bit more of your passive structures, like your connective tissues. And uh, realistically, now, my, how should I say this? My own experience was kind of mixed with this. I just felt like it depended on where I was strength-wise. So um, uh, probably to shorten this, I, what I would say is, you know, there was a number, a number of years ago, uh, Ido Portal, who's a very famous movement expert in Israel, suggested, uh, he, he started talking a lot about hanging and just doing like a certain amount. I think it was like seven minutes every day. And he said, you know, do active, do passive, what have you. And I think he later added that if you have maybe hypermobile shoulders, it's better to do active hanging because hypermobility means, in essence, that your passive structures or your connective tissues, like your tendons and ligaments, uh, they're a little bit lax. So they have a little bit more movement than, than they otherwise normally would. And, uh, and it might not feel great on your shoulders if you do that. So it's better to at least start with active hangs until you've built up the strength and that you can rely a little bit more on the passive structures. Now, if you have very stiff shoulders, he suggested uh, it'd be better to do passive hangs. I, I think I might be getting some of this like a, uh, or some of his recommendations, uh, maybe I might be slightly off on it, but that was in essence, that was it. If you're hypermobile, it's better to do active. If you are not hypermobile, um, you might get a little bit more out of hanging passively because it's going to do more for your shoulder mobility. Um, I do both. I like doing both. I found that the, uh, the stronger I am, the more, um, the nicer the passive hanging kind of feels. And like, for example, if I'm doing one arm hangs, when I first started doing those, I only did them active. And uh, as time went on, then I would start doing them passive as well because I found that, you know, it, it felt just fine. But initially, I didn't want to do that for fear of causing some damage. Um, you know, you have to kind of ease your way into it and, and figure those things out as you go. But uh, in other, in other way, um, sorry, other things um, in terms of where should your head be looking, you know, what should be going on elsewhere. Um, I think it's kind of like with crawling. Uh, you know, you hear people who are like, you should maintain a neutral spine, whatever that means. 
and everybody's got a different idea of what smooth thrill is. So like, look at the ground, uh, and it's like, well, we talked earlier about swinging on the uh, on your door jam pull-up bar. You know, unless you unless you want your wife yelling at you, like, why did you tear this you know board off the top for the swinging or whatever? Like, you don't if you want your spouse yelling at you because you put your head through the drywall because you were looking at the ground. You know, by all means, and it's not wrong to look at the ground. It's just better to look up to the best of your ability and provided that your neck will, will allow. You're not trying to crane your neck or quote unquote, I'm doing the finger quotes for people who are listening on iTunes, uh, uh, hyperextend the neck. But I find the same thing is true for hanging. Like for me, when I need kind of a nice, uh, we'll say like poor man's chiropractic adjustment on my thoracic spine, I like to look down and tuck my pelvis under I feel like I get a, you know, a nice little extra boost, not only of some shoulder, like overhead shoulder mobility, but also like the, the vertebrae in my thoracic spine tend to open up quite a bit better. So I think it's all dependent on the person. I think if you have a tendency to look down because you're constantly craning your neck forward at work, probably makes more sense to look straight forward or perhaps slightly up. But, um, but there are no, no hard and fast rules other than don't get hurt. Don't get hurt. I like right. that rule. That's a good rule. So let's say there are people out there and they don't have a TRX and they don't have rings and they don't have a door uh, pull-up system there. Mm -hmm. And so hanging is not, as, and there's no monkey bars and no trees in their, in their yard. Say they live in the city. Um, but somehow in the city they have found kettlebells or, or dumbbells or whatever. Would farmer's carries or suitcase carries be uh, an intermediate way to start kind of hanging so the the weight is hanging from you versus you hanging from it mm -hmm. but that would still strengthen your grip and maybe also strengthen your shoulders and help prepare the body for hanging is that something that's worth a shot totally i mean i think the two of those work together quite well you're, you're going to get different benefits but at some like at some point like you pointed out they'll overlap a little bit so if you look think of like that mastercard symbol with the two circles that kind of right. overlap uh, the one thing you'll definitely get for sure is uh, grip strength and grip endurance, which can be very helpful for the hanging. Um, you're not, you're not going to get the mobility per se because you just don't have your hands in that same position. Unless you're doing some overhead carries, for example, like you have uh, like a kettlebell uh, in the overhead press position, provided your mobility will permit it. And only one at a time, by the way. Right. Uh, just, Why is that? Dan, okay, I'm going to go back to Dan John because he's okay. the most quotable man in history. Uh, he has probably the best quote ever about why not to do two bells overhead unless, you know, you're, you like taking risks. But I think for that, for most people, it's not a wise idea. But what he said is there's a quote in Don Quixote where the, the stone hits the bucket or the bucket hits the stone, it's going to be bad for the bucket. <laughs> so if you have one kettlebell, it's easier to get out of the way. If you got to dodge two, <laughs> your bucket's going to be a hurting unit. So <laughs> don't, don't get hurt. Remember, that's the only rule. That's a good rule. Um, it's a good rule. Yeah, it's a very useful rule. One thing uh, farmers carries will also do uh, is they're they're nice for stretching as well as strengthening the traps or the the muscles that are kind of between your shoulders and your neck, right? Um, so that can be very useful for a lot of people because you know it, when we're you know the startle reflex, we spend a lot of time hunched over, right? And I, I I'm sorry, uh, chin forward. I was gonna say eyes forward, but chin forward, kind of like head, uh, forward head carriage movement. Um, so that could be very nice also for the posture. And a matter, as a matter of fact, um, you know, in, in the original strength, as you know, we talk a lot about carrying things as being an essential part of basically grabbing the baton where the, where the five foundational resets, um, you know, uh, going all the way to the gate pattern. The next thing to do is to load it up, right? Or one of the next things to do is to load it up. Uh, so carrying is awesome for that. I think the biggest benefit you'll get is certainly in the grip. Um, you know, you'll get some postural benefits too, which will certainly help, like the ability to uh, keep your shoulders down and back. Um, but uh, I would say, yeah, start there for sure. But, you know, look for some other things, like at a bus stop, hang. I used to do that when I lived in Israel. I would hang at the bus stop. The great thing was nobody would bother me because they thought I was crazy. Um, right. So, you know, if you're, if you're worried about people bugging you, they would definitely not want to have anything to do with you. Um, or tree branches, That's another, provided that the tree is strong enough. It's a great way to do it. So Stuart McGill, who's pretty renowned um, for his expertise in the back area, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he does, he, in his backyard, he hangs and does pull-ups from tree branches. 
That's awesome. And Stuart McGill is like the number one spine biomechanist in the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, if he's doing it, I, I have to say he's probably got a pretty good reason. Yeah. I, 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 so certain people, if they're doing things, even if you don't know why, you're like, well, maybe it's worth doing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm going to ask you the same question just because you were talking about farmer's carries and traps. Uh, so if I'm doing farmer's carries or suitcase carries, do you recommend relaxed traps or shrug traps or both? Well, I think uh, I would separate them. Like I, I think shrugs are a great exercise and they kind of get short shrift amongst the, amongst the kettlebell world. I don't quite know why. I think part of it is that people have a tendency to uh, fall back on the muscles that are strongest. The traps just have a tendency to like predominate with everything. And if you're doing a lot of overhead work, they're going to get plenty of work in anyway. Um, but I have definitely found that shrugs uh, can be nice for helping to open up the shoulders a little because we do a lot with the shoulders pulled down and back, right? So a lot of uh, what's known as depression and retraction of the shoulders. So it makes sense to get some elevation. And this is why I think that passive uh, hanging is very useful, at least eventually. Um, you may not want to start there depending on your strength levels. If, if your strength is uh, is behind a little bit and you need to catch up, active hanging is going to be better. Then move to passive. Um, I would say likewise with the farmer's carries. I wouldn't shrug. Um, yeah, I, I would I would make shrugs like a separate exercise. where I, You'd still stand holding a couple of bells, right? And you just shrug up and down or you know it could be dumbbells barbell if you'd like um but i think doing the two together i it'd probably be better to separate them that would just be my inclination some people okay. might have better better uh experience with it than me but I, I think because most people so many people um without even knowing it have this kind of like you know shoulder elevated position from sitting all day being hunched forward um it would just be adding more to that i think they'd probably get more out of the more relaxed position okay is uh another question is grip strength correlated with shoulder health to the best of my knowledge yeah as a matter of fact um and this is something that uh, i remember reading i mean i've read it in one of the early original strength manuals because this was back when there was a day two kind of like a half day Mm -hmm. uh, and we would talk about the various different ways to load the resets. Now, I, you know, that's, uh, there's a lot of that in the uh, OS Pro and OS Performance uh, workshops. But bottoms up kettlebell carries are a great way to do it because, you know, one of the ways that you activate the rotator cuff muscles, I'm told, I'm not an, an anatomy expert, uh, is through a strong grip. And so, for example, bottoms up carries. This is another favorite exercise of Stuart McGill um, for, you know, for shoulder health. Uh, but they really help to fire up the rotator cuff muscles, which are criminally undertrained uh, in most people. Um, and uh, I would imagine, though I don't know for sure, that you would get a pretty similar response in things like hanging or other grip exercises. That in the long run, it's going to have a big benefit on your shoulder health, simply by virtue of the fact that it's going to help you better activate the rotator cuff muscles, which tend to lag behind. Uh, a lot of our other muscles and strength. Uh, and you may you may or may not know this too, but I, I've also heard, I think Pavel uh, Satsalin has said um, there's a correlation between grip strength and ab strength or core strength. Absolutely. Do you, yeah. uh, do you know anything about, about I that? Know, I know a little, and I know he's, he's mentioned that too. And I think that there are a couple of mechanisms involved. Uh, and again, this is slight, because a lot of like the, the really deep, uh, and detailed science behind it is something that is kind of like outside the periphery of what I really know very well. Mm -hmm. I I'm just essentially recounting th uh, other things that I've heard. But um, yeah, I was told one of the reasons, by the way, that we have uh, the the unique ability to uh, we number one, we have a strong grip, but we also have the ability to hang is that uh, at some point in our distant past, um, the uh, Palmer grasp reflex, which is what it is called, uh, became very important for babies because they had to hang on to their mothers, you know, while they were either uh, nomads and going from place to place. You know, the mom had to carry maybe multiple other things, so the baby had to cling very tightly. So um, even like newborn babies, have, and this you'll see this in the article too, there's a picture from like the 1800s of a, a scientist who took some thin little rod or maybe it was a pencil, I don't know. But he had a ba he had babies. He did this with I think 60 of them to to uh, 
uh, measure how long they could hang. And one of them got like over two minutes. And that might have just been on one arm. I don't know if that was on two or one arm, but that's more than what most people could do. That's a, I've, see, I've, I've, I've seen that picture you're talking about, and that is a crazy picture. Yeah. If only that, man, I hope that kid's mom like kept him doing the hanging. I, she, yeah, she looked very calm, but she definitely knew that the kid was going to let go at some point. Um, but yeah, there, the, I remember somebody telling me, um, a uh, colleague of mine in Croatia was saying that there is a, a strong connection between the core and the, and the mid, I'm sorry, the core and the, and the grip for that, and it's connected to that, where babies have to hold on tightly to their moms while they are, uh, you know, maybe carrying them all over the place. So it's like they have to brace themselves at the same time that they're holding on because it's in the presence of movement. And as we know, stability isn't an absence of movement, but it's, it's the ability to control movement so that it's not happening outside of control, right? Like if you think right. about uh, one of the reasons that the crawling is so useful for the core is your hips want to go all over the place. And we see this with, with people who are new to it, particularly with like leopard crawls, their hips will, you know, they're like rock, like seesaw back and forth. Um, and you have people do like smaller steps so that it's a little more controlled and their cores light up like crazy. And I'm, I'm willing to bet that it's something similar for the, uh, the grip and the abs, that the connection has to do with one of these uh, vestigial traits. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I have heard this. I just can't speak with a great authority. Right, right, right. No, that's that's good. That was actually uh, good information. I'm glad you brought it up. I'm going to actually, well, if you're watching this, you're, you're going to see that picture that Alex is talking about. If you're listening to this, that picture that Alex is talking about, I'm going to put it in the, the podcast. Cool. Um, so if somebody starts hanging uh, for practice, uh, should they do it? Is this something they can do every day? Should they give themselves rest uh, and only do it every other day, every two days? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think um, ostensibly you could do it daily, but the more frequently you do it, you should probably do it for shorter periods of time. So you don't want to go too crazy. One of the things you'll probably feel is that the inside of your elbow here might kind of start to feel a little bit sore. So I also recommend making sure that you're doing something to keep your forearms balanced out. So again, crawling is very good. Um, rocking back and forth can be very useful. So stuff like that will make it a little bit easier on you because again, if you're spending a lot of time with your hands like this, whether you're typing all day uh, or you know whether you're driving, you're gripping onto kettlebells and barbells and things like that, uh, you want to make sure that your strength stays balanced out. So you don't want to you don't want to go too crazy. But I think that if you were to start with just two to three days a week and see how your body um, how your body feels, or you do it as a part of your daily uh, like morning routine, and your focus is not on how long you can go, but you know, maybe it's really more uh, the the shoulder uh, strength and movement that you get from it, and that's what you're focusing on, or maybe getting that um, spinal decompression. I think you can definitely do it daily. You just, you know, you maybe do it once or twice, and then you're and then you're good to go. We should ask Chris Dillon about this because he sounds like he knows. <laughs> yeah, Chris, I will ask Chris about this. Thank you. Yeah, we'll put that in the notes. So look for that. Um. All right. Well. Alex, thank you uh, very much. So just to sum up, guys, if you're listening, um, we were talking about hanging, but really we uncovered two things that are great for longevity. Your uh, grip strength, which is highly correlated with your longevity for all diseases and everything, not just how how long you'll live, but for, for diseases like cancer, heart conditions, and things like that. And the ability to get up and down from the ground is highly correlated with your longevity. And I'm sure if we were talking to Dan, John, he would also tell you flossing your teeth Absolutely. Is, is correlated with longevity. So now if you wanted three things you could do to ensure that you had the best chance of living a healthy, happy, long uh, life, floss your teeth, <laughs> strengthen your grip, and make sure you can get up and down from the ground. Absolutely. And in case people are wondering, because I know people hate to floss, I remember hearing Dan talk about this, uh, the plaque that you build up in your teeth can end up, you know, like the more of it that ends up in your system, it will end up in your heart. Yes. So that's that's what he's talking about. And he, it's absolutely right. I floss daily. Not only will your dentist love you uh, or maybe hate you because he's not really going to be able to, he or she is not really going to be able to charge you as much because your teeth are going to be so healthy. But your cardiologist will probably give you a double high five. So there you go, guys. There's three things you can do um, after listening to this podcast to help increase your longevity. 
Um, Alex, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. I am Tim, and this is The Podcast. The Podcast with Alex Salkin. All with right. <laughs> Have a good day. Take care. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of the Original Strength Podcast. If you made it this far, thank you so much.